Welcome to the Hump Day Coffee Break. I have Kivi Leroy Miller with me. I'm going to introduce her in just a second. But if this is your first time attending these weekly training meetings, they are every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And the format is really simple. The format is 15-minute presentation, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A, and then everybody goes back to work. If you have a question during the 15 minutes of Q&A, even before then, just type it in the questions box. Take notes. Just grab a piece of paper and a pen right now before we jump right in. And with that, I'm going to introduce Kivi. Uh, Kivi, I consider a good friend. She's, a, she's one of the top nonprofit experts for marketing communications. Many of you probably already know her. If you don't know her, you can follow her on Twitter. Here's her Twitter handle. The website's right here. And she's written two must-read books. And I'm serious about this. These are books that you have to read if you're a nonprofit marketer. Nonprofit Marketing Guide. I think, Kivi, that came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's 2010. Perfect. And then the content marketing for nonprofits, as everybody knows, content marketing is really the focus that uh, nonprofits are taking. So Kivi's written this incredible book, basically a roadmap on uh, your content marketing plan and how to get the most out of it. So with that, we're going to jump right in. Now, the format is fairly simple. Again, Kivi's going to answer these three questions one at a time, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Okay. So the three questions are three tips for better email newsletters three musts for better content marketing, and three time-saving tools for marketing newbies. These are the tools. And then we're going to open it up for Q&A, of course. So, so welcome, Kivi. Thank you, John. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's get right down to business. First question is three tips for better email newsletters. So first tip is you have to be reader-centered. It has to be all about the reader. We're all little egomaniacs in our inboxes. We're only looking for stuff that's for us. So you can't just send out a bunch of generic stuff about your organization. Nobody cares. It's got to be about the reader. Number two has to be a fast read. We are not dilly-dallying around in our inboxes. We're there to do business. So what does that mean? It means you want to make it really skimmable. You want to have what we call good micro content. So good headlines, good subject line. You want lots of line space. So I can just zip through that thing really fast and see what I want to see in my inbox because it's all about me, the reader. Number three, you want to make it easy on the eyes. So I like a one-column newsletter, just black type on white background or a very light background. Don't be trying to make it look like your website. If your email newsletter is trying to duplicate your website, you're doing it wrong. It needs to be really simple and clean. There you go, one, two, three. I really like how you started with be all about the reader because that is really what it's all about, you know, and it all kind of rolls up to that, the reader, because they have the decision they have the power and the decision to delete the email or unsubscribe. So really, this is uh, it's almost like you're, you're only as good as your last email. Yeah, and so what I tell people is like you have to be personal and useful and timely. Personal, useful, and timely. Just keep those words in your head, and that will help you focus on the reader. Number two, here we go, three musts for better content marketing. Number one, you want to listen. And again, this goes back to understanding your reader, understanding the people that you're trying to attract with your content. So you need to be a really good listener to the kinds of people that you're trying to attract. Uh, really understand them. Know what they're thinking about. Um, some of the, the biggest compliments I get from people on our stuff is that, I know, have you bugged my office? Because, you know, you know exactly what I'm dealing with and what I'm struggling with and what I'm thinking about. And and I really take that as the best compliment because it means that I really am sort of listening and in tune with people. Number two is in terms of your content decisions, you always want to be solving problems and answering questions for people. That's what's really going to work for all kinds of reasons that you're doing content marketing. You know, SEO, getting your emails opened. If you're constantly answering people's questions and solving their problems, they will always come to you. And John, actually, I think this is something that you – excel at oh. um, very well. Thank you. And you know, as an outsider, I would say that this is one of the reasons you're so successful is because you're so driven to answer questions and solve problems. Thank you. I appreciate that. Not that you wanted unsolicited advice, but I think you're doing the right thing there, so keep going. Oh, good. Um, number three, I would say, is always be repurposing your content into multiple communications channels. So you really have to think of yourself as a media mogul and you know, be reusing your stuff all the time. If I can't think of three different ways I'm going to use a piece of content, it's not worth my time to sit down and create it. So you know, that can be something as simple as, well, I'm going to write something for the blog, I'm going to repurpose it into my e-newsletter, and I'm going to break it up into some tweets and Facebook posts. Fine. That's fine. I've repurposed it. I'm in at least three different channels. Of course, you can get much more complicated than that, but you know, at a minimum, 
always think how you're going to put the stuff you're creating in three different places. I love it. Yeah, because it is a lot of work, right? Especially for organizations that. It's a lot of work. Yeah, and and I know some, you know, a few nonprofits out there have started blogging, and that's a that's a pretty serious commitment, as you know, blogging, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, so so repurposing the blog post, the all the fodder and the content for the blog post for other things like tweets, Facebook updates, and so forth. Yeah, and so it really helps you think about long form content versus the short form too. I mean, they're really, despite all the sort of news about short attention spans and everyone's just talking in tweets, there still is definitely a, a place for long form content. You know, Google loves long form content because it's it's giving people the real detailed answers that they're often looking for. Mm. So blogging is great, but then you do need to be able to sort of chop that stuff into the shorter form too. Awesome. All right, number three. This is this is great. We're right on right on schedule here. <laughs> Time saving tools for marketing newbies. So the first one I would say is an editorial calendar. And that can freak a lot of people out because they think it has to be some really complicated thing. And it it doesn't. It can be like a basic grid that you draw on a piece of paper where you just have time down the side, even if you just do week one, week two, week three, week four, your communications channels across the top, email newsletter, Facebook, you know, whatever you're using, and just note when you're going to send stuff out. I mean, it can be that simple. Just thinking four weeks ahead, okay, how many newsletters am I putting out in the next four weeks? Just how much do I think I need to be on Facebook? How many presentations am I going to be giving? Just understanding what you've got on your plate in the next four weeks is going to be a huge step forward for a lot of you. And then once you can get, get that most basic structure in place, you can get more detailed about well, what is the content of those things that, is go, that are going out and how can I repurpose from one week to the next? How can I repurpose between communications channels? How can I make sure that I'm saying my call to action enough times? Okay, but you've got to start somewhere. So start with an editorial calendar. The second thing I would say is uh, what we call the marketing bank. We actually have a folder on our shared drive that we call the marketing bank. And we have a bunch of subfolders in there. But it's where you put all the stuff that you use over and over. If you have to access a file more than once or twice a month, I would put it in the marketing bank so you have it. So like we have a folder that's all logos. We have a folder that's a bunch of different photos and headshots. We have a folder that's all the different descriptions of all the different trainings that we do. All of that kind of stuff that you access repeatedly, put in the marketing bank. You'll know where it is. It's easy to find. You save so much time. The third time-saving tool, and this is, you know, this may be a little bit of a cheat, <laughs> but it, it does really create a lot of time savings for you ultimately is if you always keep the quick and dirty marketing plan in mind. And so the quick and dirty marketing plan actually has three questions. So I'm going to give you a three-part answer to answer number oh, three. The first one is, who's my audience? Who am I talking to? Got it. Okay. Don't worry about me. I'll catch second up. second one is, what's my message to those people? And often, what's my call to action to those people? And then the third one is, how am I going to deliver those messages to those people? Which communications channels am I going to use? Hmm. So if you can just keep audience, message, and delivery, just those three words in your mind, as you're going through your crazy day, it will help you focus. So often, nonprofits just want to talk about delivery. Okay, so the, the classic example that all of us in the consulting world, when we sort of make fun of nonprofits, is the billboard. It's like, oh, I got a billboard nonprofit. If you are having a conversation where it's like, oh, we just need a billboard. If we just had a billboard, it would solve all of the world's problems. People would know who we are. We'd have money like flowing in the gates. No, you wouldn't. Okay, but people get focused on the communication channels. Oh, if we only had a billboard. Oh, if we only had 100,000 people on our mailing list. Oh, if we only had this, if we only had that. And then they don't have any clue about audience or message. You're still going to fail. Hmm. So you want to short circuit those conversations about, oh if, oh, if we could only advertise on NPR. You want to go back to audience and message. Well, who are we trying, you know, who are we hoping is driving by that billboard and what is that billboard going to say? If you can focus on audience and message, most of your channel delivery questions resolve themselves. You'll, you'll be able to pick the right channel and you'll be able to cut short those stupid conversations about whether you need a billboard or not. I'm off, I'm off the soapbox about the billboard. 
Can you yeah. tell I've been like dealing with a few of these lately? I'm sorry. Oh, billboards, really? Well, dealing with nonprofits that think they need a billboard as the center of their fundraising strategy, which is huh. just ridiculous. Wow. I'm not saying billboards aren't helpful, but uh, they are one little part of an advertising strategy, which is one part of a marketing strategy, which is one part of a fundraising strategy. So if you're trying to raise money, you don't start with a billboard. Yeah. You mean like, are you, are you kidding me? Are you talking about a billboard that you see on the road? Yes. Really? Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that that would be a, a central part of a, a marketing strategy at all. Fundraising campaign. Yeah, not at yeah, all. Yeah, I know. And, see, so that, and that's why it's, it's sort of become the shorthand for nonprofits that aren't thinking it through. Yeah, exactly. And certainly don't use a billboard with a QR code. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so that's awesome. All right. So, um, so let, me, let me just open up and just see what kind of questions we have. Uh, Dennis is asking a great question here. What's the best way to find out what your newsletter readers think is useful? Well, there are a couple of ways you can do that. So you can ask. You know, a lot of the email systems that you're using to send out your newsletter include some kind of polling or surveying mechanism. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. And so, you know, use that to, to ask them questions throughout the course of the year. You know, every other month, maybe do a quick poll question mm. to your list and just ask them. Um, the other thing to do is to pay attention to what they're clicking on. Again, depending on which system you're using, sometimes this is easier than others. But um, if you regularly include three stories in your newsletter, pay attention to which stories get the most clicks. Um, mm -hmm. Look at the traffic on your website. That could be a clue as to what people are interested in that can educate you about what should go in your newsletter. So, you know, you have to do a little bit of detective work. Mm. Got it. Okay. Um, another question here from Jeffrey. Um, what if you want to use timely new news kind of stuff, trending stuff, how can you make that part of your content calendar or the editorial calendar, which you mentioned uh, under tools, editorial calendar? Right, right. So the way that I recommend you do this is to think of the rule of thirds. Okay. So, you know, figure out how many opportunities you have to communicate just on the most basic level in a given month how much stuff are you putting out, okay? So you sort of have your number at that point, number of emails, number of tweets, whatever, which is just sort of your average. A third of those, you want to plan the content, original content. Another third, you want to repurpose the first third into, okay? So you're building repurposing into your schedule. And then the third third, you leave open for the stuff that you're going you're gonna to merge in. And that's where you put the really timely sort of breaking content. And, you know, most of the time that stuff will come up for you. If it doesn't and you find yourself struggling to, to fill a hole, you can either do some more repurposing or you can go to your evergreen content, which is sort of your timeless stuff. Um, lots of you have great content in your frequently asked questions pages on your website. Um, you can preview things that are coming up. There, you know, you, you can always find more content to fill should the, the timely information should sort of be a news dead zone for some reason. Hmm. But think of the rule of thirds, a third original, third repurposed, and a third open for the timely stuff. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. Because it, it is important, I think, to take advantage of trending topics. You know, mm -hmm. there's a trending topic related to a, your cause. You want to be part of that conversation because supporters expect that. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the thing is, I don't think you, for most of you, you don't want to rely solely on that. You need to have your own core message that you're trying to get out through your content as well. Mm. And so you want to make room for both in your calendar. Got it. Got it. And Mary is saying, um, she says, oh my God, our people desperately want a billboard with a QR code. Um, so that's, that's just fun. <laughs> Uh, and let's see here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Know, talk, yeah. about, talk about who's driving by and what the message is going to be and how you probably don't want somebody holding up their phone to take a picture of the billboard when they're driving. Oh, my God. You're kidding me. Yeah. Especially if you're an organization that is trying to prevent, um, you know, drunk driving or accidents or something like that, you know. Um, so Martha's asking a question uh, about the skimmable newsletter content. Are you a fan of bolding text? Sure, as long as you don't bold everything, because then you're just making everything dark. You're not actually highlighting anything. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be very selective about it. Mm -hmm. But if, if you can be selective, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I know uh, strength.org or Kid No Hungry, their, their newsletter or their emails, they always 
bold a paragraph. It's a massive call to action. It's all one link in a paragraph, but it's bold and it's orange. It stands out from the rest of the text, which is not bold and it's black or gray. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you know, you know, if you're skimming what you're supposed to look at. Oh, exactly. It directs the eye really easily. I love it. Uh, and Norman is saying, don't forget to mention segmentation. Many, many nonprofits aren't good at that. And that gets back to your point, understanding your audience and who you're talking to. Yes, yes, that's a great point. And for those of you that aren't sure what he's talking about, um, it, it basically means breaking up your list into sublists in lots of different ways. Um, so maybe you, you know, one way to segment would be to email people who have not registered for your thing yet. Okay, so you would be segmenting based on sort of their current status with you. Mm -hmm. You might segment by sending people who are new to your list something different than people who have been on your list for a long time. You might segment by your programming. If you have really diverse programming, you know, like cats versus dogs. You've got your dog people and you've got your cat people. So understanding what people care about is another way to segment. Got it. Now, Tori has an interesting question, but I think you kind of answered that. Um, Tori is saying, I work at a large national organization that is starting individual giving campaign and we want, and we don't know our target audience. How do we learn um, who could be our target audience through content marketing? And I think you mentioned looking at emails that people have been opening up in the past, looking at uh, top viewed content on your website, the pages that people are viewing, maybe even tweets or Facebook updates that people are engaging with the most. Um, but did, did you want to add anything more to that? Again, the question is, how do we learn about our audience through content marketing? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think those are all good tips. You know, I'm all for asking people. You know, if you if you sort of know who your kind of typical donors are, um, and you want more of those kinds of people, then doing a quick focus group, and it doesn't have to be like the you know blind mirror type thing. You just can call a bunch of people, or get them in a room, and just have a casual conversation with them about sort of what's going on in their lives. You know, go back to answering questions and solving problems. You have to know what their questions are and what their problems are. Hmm. So. You know, asking people, you know, what's most difficult in your day? Um, what are some of the challenges that you face? Hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I often recommend to organizations that to view using social media differently instead of just viewing it as a channel to post stuff and just to get our get the word out. And I'm using air quotes when I say get the word out. But use it as right. a, use it as a venue to ask people very specific questions that they can so that they can learn about their audience. You know, posting questions on Twitter or on Facebook mm -hmm. or or even um, a blog. You know, writing a blog post with a question at the end and then. Looking at the comments, those are all ways for, I think, organizations to learn about their audience pretty easily. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Lloyd is asking, um, how often is too often for a frequency of sending newsletters? And I know that in the, um, the nonprofit communications um, report, the, is that the, the trends report? Yeah, the trends report. I believe it was monthly is the most common rhythm. Yes. So, you know, this email frequency question comes up all the time, and what I usually say is that I think most people aren't emailing enough. Now, granted, I don't know how much you're emailing, so I don't know for sure if that applies to you or not, but the overwhelming majority of nonprofits are emailing at least monthly, at least monthly. So, you know, I, I try to push people towards twice a month. There are some of you that should be doing it weekly. If you have a highly engaged community that wants to hear from you and you have a solid content marketing strategy, you should probably be doing weekly. Hmm. But I would not do quarterly, for example. I think that's a total waste of time. It's like, why bother? It's just, it's not enough. You have to be in front of people so they recognize you and in their inbox. And if you're only emailing them quarterly, that it's just not enough sort of frequency to have me even recognize who you are. So at least monthly. I would say monthly is the minimum. Hmm. Got it. Okay. There is a bunch of other questions here. Let me just um, pick one here. Sorry. Uh, 
Okay, so Emily is, uh, this is a really interesting question, and I've run into this question a lot myself. My organization likes to talk about ourselves because our client stories are private. So they talk about the organization. What's a good way to start to shift the focus? In other words, starting to talk about, it sounds like stories, as opposed to start talking about the organization, talking about or outcome stories. Um, and then she just adds, staff provide stories, and by the time we get them approved, or I get them approved, they're really watered down. Mm hmm. So, you know, there, there are a couple different ways you can go about this when you have privacy concerns. The first is to realize that you don't really need that many individual stories because you're going to be really good at repurposing them. So if you can get a handful of clients to agree to have their story used, literally, like if you can get three to five human beings a year to consent to have their story used, even if you do have, you still need to change their names or change a few identifying details, that's going to be enough content for you. So you don't have to get permission from everybody, not even a majority, just a handful of people. Okay, so that would be the first thing I would try. If you can't even do that, then what you want to do are use some sort of narrative storytelling tactics that allow you to tell stories but still protect people's privacy. So you do things like imagine if you were blah, blah, blah. And then you basically tell somebody's story but because you're saying, imagine if you, John, were you know, kicked out of your house and you had two small children, where would you go? Hmm. It allows you to basically tell the story without violating anybody's privacy. That's you can also tell the story from the perspective of your staff. Again, I'm sort of going down like this is not as good as telling the, the story in the first person. But you know, it's, let's just say, I have no idea what the organization is, but let's just say you have social workers who work there. So you could tell the, pers tell the story from the perspective of the social worker. Hmm. You, know, the, you know, I see a lot of clients, and, you know, but there are always a handful who, even at the end of the day, even though I've been doing this for 20 years, that you know, still make me cry at night. Let me tell you about one of them. And then you, know, you sort of tell a composite or a generic version of a, a still typical story. You don't want to make it too fantastical, but as long as it feels authentic and you're not truly sharing details that are going to help us pinpoint which client you're talking about, then that's totally acceptable too. Hmm. Got it. Now there, here's an, here's an interesting question from Annalise. Um, she's asking how do we, how can we segment by age group? So we use larger font sizes. Um, so we use larger <laughs> font sizes when we don't have their birthdays in our database. And I just want to start out by throwing out there that, um, the assumption here, or her assumption, is that the, that it's segmenting by age is actually important. Would you, would you agree with that? Uh, you know, I think that really depends. And, you know, I would say just make the font a little bit bigger for everybody. I mean, we're not talking like 24 point here. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm 46. And I'm starting to need the reading glasses. Like, I hate it. But, <laughs> you know, people in their 40s, those of you that are younger, you just wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait until you go blind. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and John, you're, you're, I think you're actually better at some of this technology stuff than I am. But, you know, you can also send it. If you send it by the default, then it reads at the screen setting that's the default on the user's computer hmm. right and so, yeah I don't I know mean, most, it depends. But, you know I, we send most of our stuff in 12 and 14 yeah I do 18 and 20 but then again I'm there blind I'm totally blind there you go <laughs> you know? I think you're younger than I am John. But, so there. I know really I said, I said it so that I can read it <laughs> yeah that's funny um oh and uh let's see I'm we just have time for one or two more let me just see if I can find another one. Oh, oh this is a great one Ah, you've heard this a million times. How can I convince my supervisor that our weekly email newsletters are not being read? I, I show her open rates, but she insists that we need to continue this piece. It's a major staff drain, and I'm concerned people aren't growing tired of it. Most people read our job postings, but hardly any of the articles we include in the, uh, e, uh, the weekly e-newsletter. So it sounds like she has the data. She's showing it to the supervisor, but the supervisor's really not listening. Right. So, okay, this is where I, 
I don't know. I either get in trouble or this is why people really like me. I can't tell sometimes. But um, <laughs> I, you know, yeah, okay. Let it rip. Keep trying, to, keep trying to convince the boss, right? I'm all for that. Absolutely. Keep working the data. However, I would say, you know, there's a point at which communications directors just need to do it. Just go rogue and do it. So, you know, I would say start changing the stuff up on your own. Start making incremental changes, like slip the stuff in when they're not looking, and start to see what works for yourself. And then you can sort of come back and say, look, you know, let's compare these two articles. This thing actually worked better. You don't have to say this was my idea and this was your stupid sucky idea that didn't work. You can just say, oh, this curious thing happened. Look, uh, you know, we, we talked about this and it worked. Maybe we should do a little more of that. Hmm. Yeah, it's you, know, you got to be a little covert about it sometimes. Yeah, and sometimes you know, <laughs> you just do it. Yeah, it's like asking for forgiveness rather than permission. Yeah, I'm a big advocate of that, and sort of all of life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I know is not everybody's approach, hmm. but you know, I think in our world, um, your boss does not have time to understand best practices. That's what they hired you for, and yet hmm. I know they don't listen to you a lot either. So, you know, I think you have to be a little wily about this stuff sometimes mm -hmm. and yeah. um, just go out there and try to make some stuff happen. Yeah, you could just say, send out a newsletter and then uh, go rogue, like Kibby says, and all of a sudden your open rates and everything goes through the roof and say, oh my God, it's a total mistake. I didn't mean to send this out. I hit send and oh, but look what happened, you know. No, I didn't actually suggest that, John did. I'm right. just saying, it, you know, <laughs> it's, it's give it some thought. Yeah. Like what you can, what you can get away with. Yep. Awesome. All right. Great. Well, that's the last question, or actually that's the last one that we have time for. Um, if you have more questions, I highly recommend, in fact, these are the next steps for you guys listening. Um, first of all, go to Nonprofit Marketing Guide, and I believe there's there's a way to join, um, to become a free member on there and get access to a lot of really incredible resources. Yep. Yep. There is. Just click the free membership button. Yep, beautiful. Um, and also get these two books. I really recommend them. These are must reads for every single nonprofit. Thank so you, that's, John. So that's everybody's homework. And with that, I want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And especially thank you, Kivi. And we will all talk very soon, I hope. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Kivi. Bye.